Welcome to the Seat Go Create podcast. This is Tim Winders, your host. I'm a coach for business owners, executives, and leaders. And I like to describe myself as a nomad. My wife and I are nomads. We currently travel, live, and work in our 39-foot RV. Today is extremely unique in that I am not recording my portion from the front office of my RV. I'm actually in a home visiting my parents just outside of Atlanta. And so, uh, so I want to welcome you here. What I want to ask you to do, those of you that are listening, make sure that you listen to the end of the podcast. We will include ways that you can continue the conversation we start today by connecting with us directly. Today, we have Nick Rathel as our guest. Nick is the creator of The Seven Hour Book. And as someone who's just spent three years working on a novel, I am fascinated by this concept and we're going to have fun with it. This system allows any real estate investor, but I can tell you, I'm going to ask about it from a lot of other angles also, to get their own professionally published book while spending only seven hours of time. With the seven hour book, Nick is on a mission to help investors and others in real estate finally get the recognition they deserve. Nick, welcome to the Seek Go Create podcast. Great to be here. Thank you so much, Tim. Yeah, it's good to have you here. My first question I like to ask, I prepped you a little bit for it just a few minutes ago, is after I gave you the bio and kind of the marketing message and all, what do you do? Someone asked you, what do you do? What do you tell them? I help to get the demons out of people. And <laughs> you, you're a you de- could, are you an exorcist? <laughs> in a sense, in a sense. And what I mean by that is not literally in the sense of the movie, you know, with the girl's head going around, not that kind of exorcist, but many of us have essentially demons, if you will, haunting us up in our heads. And the demon, in this case, in the analogy, is the idea for a book. Many of us have had that idea, and it just haunts us for years on end often, that we should do a book, we know we should do a book, but how exactly are we going to carve out the time to create the book? And that's really where we come in. Wow, that's excellent. So you remove, man, that's such a strong word, demons. And you mentioned the, the movie, I'll have to say, man, that was one of the worst movies I ever saw because it like got all inside me. I hope, I hope no one's <laughs> seen the actual movie, The Exorcist. But anyway, well, that is cool because we're going to discuss that because I, my guess is, Nick, that a lot of what you teach and help people with can apply across a lot of different areas. Is that true? It is. It is. We've certainly concentrated a lot in real estate investing, but we as well have attorneys, and people from various other sectors, certainly entrepreneurs too, who we're working with. Okay, that's good. Because one of the things I wanted to do right here early on is just in case someone may not have interest in real estate. I love real estate. I know we have a lot of listeners that do. I want to make sure that they're going to get some value. And I know they are because you're also a high productivity guy, I think from kind of doing some research. And I think I think that's going to be, um, be fun to uh, take a look at. All right. First thing I like to do kind of in this time that we're in, we're um, late summer and, you know, there's pandemic, there's all kinds of stuff going on. Uh, Nick, just give us a glimpse of, you know, uh, is everyone around you and you safe? Is everyone doing well? What part of the world are you in? Just give us a glimpse of Nick's world right now. And we're hopeful everyone's doing good. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, first off, I mean, everyone is, is definitely fine, um, fortunately. I guess knock on wood, I got a wooden wooden part of the wall here, knock on wood. But, uh, but yeah, everything is fine in that regard. And they're really just trying to stay active, not only in working with the clients we have on the books, but also just staying physically active. Physically active, eating right, um, whether that's probiotics, uh, also eating, strangely enough, a lot of sauerkraut. Kind of uh, <laughs> stumbled across that recently, but it's supposed to be very good for boosting your immune system. And uh, just really, again, trying to stay in good health amidst everything that's going on. Yeah, you know, my wife would love that. She has been attempting to get me to eat more of the, um, of the, uh, the sauerkraut, not only being the cabbage, but also the fermented that's great for the gut and everything like that. And, you know, you brought up something. I actually may ask a little bit more about it because I think this would be kind of a cool conversation for where we are currently in the world. There is so much uncertainty around a lot of things. My wife and I were discussing this recently, and she's really big on health, and we both try to watch what we eat as best we can and fitness and things. 
And, uh, and the, the only thing that we've really arrived at, Nick, and I'd love your thoughts on this, is that, that all we can control is our, as best we can, is our immune system and increasing it or, um, you know, energizing it, whatever terms you want to use as best we can. It sounds like you've been studying that some. Yeah, I think that's a very fair point, what you're saying. And it ties in, in a way, to a philosophy that I think a lot of listeners can probably resonate with, mm -hmm. which is the philosophy of Stoicism. And the fact that as Stoicism teaches, really, it's about Stoicism, and then also groups like Alcoholics Anonymous, and even a little bit of getting the Judeo-Christian faiths, talking about focusing on what you can control, understanding what you can't control, and then, as they say, having the wisdom to know the difference. Yeah, all right. So, uh, you know, I told you when we started that, that we would kind of dig into some things based on conversation. And we're going to dig into because I could tell you're a proponent of stoicism, which I dig. Um, I'm actually have a background in ministry, a follower of Christ. But I believe that there is great wisdom that can be learned from what we'll call the stoic. So I may in just a little while ask you to give people a little explanation. It seems like you probably could do that. And give us a little a little bit on that. So that is that is really cool. First thing I want to do, though, before we get too far away from the topic is I want to talk about books in general and just the value of them. And uh, but then I may want to come back because I'd like to really get into some of your background and how you've come to be what you're doing, because I, I think there's a lot of wisdom when we can dig in with people like that. So first question, why is a book important? Why would anyone want a book? One of the biggest things that comes to mind is the fact that the real estate, if you will, around a book is not as crowded as the real estate, figuratively speaking, online or in other mediums. I mean, podcasts are excellent, but if you go on iTunes, it's not a stretch to say that there's quite a few on there. 1.4 on 4 million and a big chunk of those were started since March. I read that my, this morning. My goodness, 1.4 million, you said. Yeah. <laughs> and with a book, there are certainly more than 1.4 million books, but within your niche and within the goals that you're probably looking to achieve, you being anyone listening to the show, there's probably a whole lot less competition. Or even if there is competition, it's probably likely that you can figure out your lane and your angle within it and pursue that in such a way as to further your own goals. Okay, good. So, and I know we're going to talk specifically about your system and all later as we get towards the end of the podcast, but, but in general, let's just say someone has a book. What are some of the things that they can do with that? What does it do for them? You know, do they automatically become an authority in their field or just what are some of the benefits of having a book? I mean, you mentioned why it's important, but just give me some tangible things. Sure. Well, I'm happy to do that. But I do want to say just in full transparency, as we get started here, uh -huh. that I don't think a book necessarily is the right thing for everyone. Ah. Just in complete honesty, because we're talking about, we were just talking a moment ago about podcasts and other forms of media. And I think that depending on a person's goals, if they really take a step back and think about it objectively they might conclude that perhaps they just need to spend more on ads or maybe they just need to go to more in-person networking events or pursue some other means than just a book. So I want to make sure that's in our conversation because it is important to really know your why before you even dig into this. Yeah. And that's a great point. I actually am in a few groups that are podcast focused, you know, like people that do podcasting and Nick, it's really interesting that, there are a lot of people that podcasting is their goal. And to me, podcasting is a tool. Would you say that a book is, is a tool? Uh, you know, it, it's, I mean, a book isn't a business. A podcast isn't a business. Now it can be a part of it. Is that kind of what you're saying with this? I think so. Although the, I think the caveat to that in the case of both books and podcasts is if you really are just doing it as a passion project or in the sense that, you feel a pride of a pride of creatorship in a sense in having that book out there or in having that podcast that your name is behind it and really is a statement about you. If you're pursuing it from that angle, then it could certainly be the end itself. 
but primarily I think it should be, and probably for many people is a means toward a greater end. And you were asking Tim about what those ends could be. Yeah. So a couple instances would be one, a way to get yourself out there and launch your speaking career. If you're an entrepreneur, for example, and you have started a number of companies, you've had a number of successful exits, let's say, and now you think, you know what, I've learned some leadership principles and I think I could go out there and really do well and make a difference, not only do well, but make a difference mm -hmm. as a speaker, then a book could potentially be your ticket to that. And if you were going down that angle, you might have your book, let's say be 10 chapters and each of those chapters could be essentially a keynote speech in and of itself. So then when you're going out to speaking boards and the organizers of various events, you could just send them a chapter from your book and be like, okay, this would be an example of a speech I could give. Um, another instance of using a book to launch yourself might be if you look at, um, do you ever read the book Extreme Ownership? Extreme Ownership? I don't think so. I don't know that I've heard of that one. Tell us about it. Okay. There was a, uh, there's an ex-Navy SEAL out there, Jocko Willink. Ah, and yes. I'm, yes, I'm familiar had, with him. He basically used that book along with a TED Talk and some other pieces to launch himself in his coaching yes. and his executive training. So that would be an instance as well of using a book to really leverage it. Yeah. And someone recently told me about a YouTube channel that he's got that's just, that's just going gangbusters. And so, so really it is, it, it may or may not be a standalone, but it's a piece to this puzzle, which is the bigger business that someone may have. So that, that was excellent. Very good. Thank you for sharing that with us. Uh, the, I guess the thing that I'd love to do now is I'd kind of like to back up a little bit. Tell me a little bit about Nick. I mean, uh, you know, this is something that's interesting. Um, my guess is you're uh, quite a reader, correct? Oh, yes, absolutely. Tell, tell me a little bit about your reading habit, not, not specifically what you're reading, but kind of what is your habit for reading? I like how you describe that, a reading habit. Yeah. <laughs> almost, almost like an addiction, which I think for those of us who are, uh, who are very much into reading, it certainly can become an addiction. Yeah. Um, in terms of the reading habit, yeah. it's, uh, it's <laughs> definitely primarily concentrated in these past, uh, over the past decade or so around nonfiction. Although I started off uh, certainly reading my fair share of science fiction and mystery stories, detective stories, those kinds of things really concentrated around nonfiction and then moving more specifically in terms of books to really develop various core competencies. I do want to take a step back though on that and with reading for your listeners, uh, echo a really great quote I heard from Naval Ravikant, who has a really interesting podcast. He's the founder of Angel List. Mm. And uh, his, his quote was essentially, start off reading what you love and then eventually you'll love reading. And use kind of use your passion initially for the things that get you excited with reading to then parlay that into reading the more difficult stuff once you actually enjoy reading. Yeah. But um, but anyway, in the kind of the self help self development stuff, very much into things around um, certainly endurance mindset, and then beyond that into really business strategies, uh, with a particular emphasis on productivity, which considering the seven hour book, a lot of that productivity reading fed into that and fed into the thinking that gelled together to make the seven hour book. Yeah. And I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to ask you quite a bit on that here shortly, but uh, where, where'd you grow up, man? What part of the world are you from? And uh, I like to find out things that feed into, because I believe we're all layers. I believe we're layered and we are who we are today because of situation, circumstances, intentional focuses that we've had in the past. So what part of the world are you originally from? I know you're in California now, but what part of the world are you from? Certainly based out East Coast, DC area. DC I guess area. This is, a, this is the seek part of the show, right? The seek, go create, the seek portion. Yeah, 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 yeah. You're right. That's good. If, if, yeah, we can call it that. <laughs> so the DC area, huh? Is that where you grew up, went to school? Is that your formative years there? Formative years, if you will. Yep, yep. Wow. Okay. So, so tell me something good that was positive about growing up in that area, that part of the world, either, you know, could be whatever. And then maybe something that was a bit of a challenge about being in that area. I always like to, you know, have the good with maybe the tough parts because again, that feeds who we are. 
Certainly. Well, I think I could probably merge those two together. Actually. Oh, good. Um, oh, wow. This with, is going to be fun. Go ahead. <laughs> well, the, the good and the bad is something you can relate to now, too, where you are in Atlanta, which is the heat. Uh, you know, D.C. being on the, uh, the eastern seaboard, very humid during the summer. And that can be a really bad thing, particularly when you don't have air conditioning or have fans in your house. But it can also be a really good thing, as I like to do endurance sports and being outside it really builds your ability to just power through things and understand that this heat may be temporary, but if I just keep going, it's eventually going to pass, not only on the particular exercise I'm doing, but in a few months when the temperature literally does cool down and the humidity literally does go away. Yeah, it's almost all of a sudden you feel like you've got, uh, you know, 20 pound weights not on you when you're out there. Doing <laughs> yeah. That. Yeah. And that, you know, I think we joked a little bit. I'll go ahead and give the, uh, the listener a little bit of behind the scenes. Uh, in the home I'm in, my parents' home right now where I'm doing my recording, it is, uh, it is hot, it's humid, and the AC is out. So uh, I've turned off the fan so that it won't mess with some of the video we're capturing, but I'm possibly dripping sweat <laughs> as I'm recording here. So, so we're, having, we're having some fun with that. So, uh, so after school, I mean, like, where, where'd you do after that? What, what are some things that you did prior to developing you know, the seven hour book concept and all that you did that, what are some things that led up to it and, and helped, uh, helped you get to that place? Certainly. Well, one of them, as we mentioned a little bit before this was just the reading and reading, not only in the sense of developing a lifelong love for books, but also in really coming to understand productivity, time management, and how do you, how do you really get more done? And one of the things as well, one of the conversations, recurring conversations really, that led into this was when I was working in marketing and advertising, doing some online advertising, I would talk to people who had ideas for books and I'd be like, okay, well, why don't you just do it? And they always, time and again, I can't tell you how many times, Tim, they would say, well, you know, I just don't have the time or some variation of that. And when you listen to a lot of personal development things, you certainly hear the track where people, you, you hear the track where the people are ad, advocating to get rid of your excuses and you have time if you make time. And there is certainly something to be said for that. At the same time, however, the same breath, there are some cases, particularly people who have families or who are at various points in their career, when it's a little bit more complicated, I believe, than just make time for the things that are important. When there really are very clear things constraining you in your ability to make time for something. And it was sort of understanding that that led me to think, well, how can we make this work? Right, right. So, all right. So you've, it sounds like you've been a real student of productivity and how to get things done and uh, maybe not uh, procrastinating. Um, what are, what are some significant books that you've that you've read in that arena that have impacted that you could share with us uh, and, and the audience. Let me ask you a question. Have you read Tim Ferriss's four hour work week? You know, it's funny you mentioned that because that was literally going to be the first book I'd, I'd point out there. Well, I actually um, had a question down. I'm like going, okay, seven hour book sounds a lot like the four hour work week. Tell me if there's anything related to that. So, so Tim, Fer yeah, that, that was significant for me too. I won't lie. Yeah, that book. I mean, it's, it's really interesting book because it's, I feel like you can look at it from a couple of different ways. Mm -hmm. uh, one of those ways being if you literally interpret the philosophy of sell your things, travel around the world, that that's one way you could take it. You can also look at it as I think a lot of people have, which is from a top down look that these are some suggestions for things that then you can threads that you can take and run in your own direction with loose philosophies, like what he talks about with outsourcing, and you can kind of make those philosophies your own instead of literally applying it as a blueprint. And then I think a third thread that people and listeners can get something out of if they read the book through this lens is read it as a, essentially an infomercial. Look at all of the ploys. And I say ploys in a really nice way because he's yeah. a brilliant copywriter. But if you look at it from the marketing standpoint and through a marketing lens, how can you apply some of those things to your own business, into the ads into the testimonials and the aspects of your business to market more effectively. Yeah. And you talk about someone who basically launched their, you know, their empire from a book. I know he was doing some things prior to that, but 
but that book literally launched, you know, Tim Ferriss to all types of things. And he's continuing to, uh, to ride off, off of that in a lot of ways. So, you know, one thing, one thing that was interesting to me about that book was when I first picked it up, one thing I need to share with you, I'm an industrial engineer from Georgia Tech. So process system structure is kind of baked into my, my DNA. And so one of the things that I have to do is at times back off of high productivity items so that I could be more creative and have some, you know, white space. Otherwise I could be, I could be, you know, doing everything really, really structured and things like that. But, uh, but when I saw four hour work week, I read it initially, literally. In other words, as if that there could be some four hour work week. And, and as you get into it, you realize that is a possibility, but it's really more the mindset and principles. Would you agree with that? I mean, <laughs> I would a hundred percent agree with that <laughs> because I, I have not, I mean, listen, I've met a lot of people and I get where you could totally offload all your business and all that, but I haven't met many people that for four hours a week, they could, they could actually achieve and accomplish to the levels that he talks about. But Principles are awesome, which are, which are really cool. So anything else under productivity, anything else that you'd like to share with us? Because to me, this is building up to the thought process for getting something done as quickly as, as you say that people can get it done. So what else led into your productivity, um, the way you are wired for productivity? Certainly a couple other influences. Uh, one of them, which I personally believe is one of the things that led into the four hour work weeks, actually time management, which is Brian Tracy. If you look back to the, I think it was the 1980s or maybe early nineties, Brian Tracy has a complete seminar where he goes through many of the productivity principles, which seem to be later on echoed in the four hour work week. Yeah. So Brian Tracy, you can uh, check it out on YouTube. Actually, it might still be up there, but Brian Tracy uh, time management is a complete section Along with that Eat That Frog, Brian Tracy is a really good one in terms of just books about tackling your most important thing. While we're talking about your most important thing, of course, another book, can't leave it out, would be The One Thing, uh, Gary Keller, J. Papazan. Specifically for that, their idea of time blocking in that you're setting aside specific moments, specific segments of time to do things. And then I think, uh, I think another aspect of it would also just be athletic training. I mean, growing up, I grew up a swimmer. And in swimming, among other activities, when you're training, you're doing various sets under specific intervals of time. I mean, to the point where you'll stop at the wall, you'll look, it'll be counting down five, four, three, two, one, you go. And so you get yourself mentally focused and trained really to be moving exact, exactly to a watch and to be doing things exactly on schedule like that. Yeah, yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to back up to something you mentioned, and I want to allow the listener to get a little more information on it. You brought up the concept of time blocking, and uh, I've actually been teaching, working with, and doing time management, back when time management was a thing, uh, <laughs> since, uh, since the late 80s, early 90s. But there are many people that either, one, they don't know what time blocking is, or two, they don't quite understand it, or three, they can't apply it. I don't know, one of those three. Um, tell us a little, let's, let's you and I, let's banter a little bit. Let's talk about time blocking, because is that, is that a primary way that you use to, to effectively get things done? Is that, is that what you use? Yeah, it is one of the things. Um, of course, you re keep referencing getting things done, GTD, David Allen. Uh, would be another another tool out there for your listeners. But yeah, sure. time blocking, absolutely. And uh, my own understanding of it is that it's essentially you take your calendar and you figure out what points on the calendar or points uh, singular you're going to be doing a particular activity and you put it on the calendar. And then everything else aligns around that rather than the other way around where you try to throw everything together at a single date on the calendar and yep. make it all fit in. Yeah, that's because in the world we're in, it doesn't fit. And so what that does is it leaves possibly some extremely critical items not getting done. And uh, so, yeah, you're right. And that I use, I think I use a hybrid of a few things, but I think that blocking is what I do. If you look, if you were to look at my calendar right now 
on Google, you would see time blocked out for writing, time blocked out for preparation, thinking. I leave some white space because I like to not just pack things in. So, uh, so that is a, um, that's a great thing to do and great thing for people to, uh, to check out and get more information on. So, another, uh, yeah, go ahead. I, I'm sorry. Another tactic that I want to put out there that uh, I've heard that I also employ, which I think your listeners would get a lot out of, is the idea of, I believe it comes from Think and Grow Rich with their example with Andrew Carnegie, where he talks about writing down, he, it's an idea he got, I think, from an industrial engineer, Andrew Carnegie, getting it from an engineer in the story and Think and Grow Rich. But the idea was that you're supposed to write down your five most important things you have to do, put them in order, and then just tackle them one by one. So having that top five method, as I call it, where you just write down the five most important things you need to do that day and just systematically go through one, 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 getting them done. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I'm actually, I'm taking notes as we speak on a yellow pad with an actual pen in my hand. And, you know, one of the things I've noticed, I'm, I'm in my mid fifties and, and I, I've gone digital primarily with almost everything I have. But uh, this last, I think it was this last Christmas, my son, who's, who's 26, also the engineer and producer for the podcast, he gave me, because he knows kind of how I like to scratch out notes and all like I'm doing right now. I've, got a, I've already got a page of notes just from our conversation. And uh, he gave me like this pack of three yellow legal pads. And it was, I mean, I, I got a lot of great gifts. It was like, okay, it was probably my most used gift. I think I'm right at the end of those three, by the way, here, you know, six months into the year, because I'll write on the front page, back page a little, but, um, but the thing that I love to do is exactly what you said. And that is at the beginning of a day, I'll take three, five things. I'm going, you know what, I'm going to get these things done today, you know, either in my white space or I'm going to block some time to get these things done and I'll just kind of write them out, make a note or two. And I love, it gives me great joy to kind of check them off. <laughs> and and that's, a, that's a great thing. So, um, all right. I want to circle back, Nick, and I want to talk a little bit more about the concept of stoicism. And what I'd love for you to do for the uneducated is to give us, uh, I mean, yeah, I know a bit of the history of it and obviously there were groups called the stoics and but tell us a little bit of background and then i'll go ahead and tell you what the follow-up question is going to be but you can give the background first the follow-up question is going to be how can that help us in our world that we're in today so give us some background first and or tell us what it is tell people that don't know what it is and maybe where it came from sure so of course to preface that, the obvious point, I'm not a professor on stoicism by any means. But you've studied, it. you've studied it and you're a practicer probably, right? Okay, okay. I just want to get that out there because there are certainly a lot of, a lot more qualified people to speak on that. But when it comes to stoicism, my own understanding of it is that it's a philosophy originating from, originally from Greece, but most of the stoicism we hear about is from ancient Rome. And it's been centered around three main figures, uh, Marcus Aurelius, Epictetus and Seneca. That's the third one. Marcus Aurelius, Epictetus, and Seneca. And the idea is really on focusing on controlling yourself and self-management as opposed to trying to influence the outside world. And so the world around you can be going to hell, but you, as long as you're able to remain in control of yourself, it's almost, almost like what's going on in the outside world doesn't necessarily matter as much as it would otherwise. Right. So the, so the implication is, is that someone will use the word stoic. Someone that is stoic is very unemotional, but I don't know that that's correct. It seems like from what you just said, they're more unfazed by external situations. Would that be right? It would be, it would be. And you know, there's people who are much are more qualified to speak on stoicism as experts than myself they've raised the point numerous times that the, what we think of as the stoic, you know, unemotional Mr. Spock essentially yeah. is not, is not in line with the true vision of stoicism. I remember I was listening to a uh, podcast actually on stoicism and they made the point that Gene Roddenberry, the Star Trek creator thought he knew a stoicism when he was modeling Spock, but he really only had a surface level understanding of it. 
so no, to the long way of answering your question, Tim, but no, being unemotional is not the idea of stoicism. It's more unshakable. Mm. And it's more, the idea is more in responding to things rather than reacting to things. Right. Where reaction is, the idea of reacting is you could react angrily or you could react, you know, with extreme sorrow. But if you respond to something, your response can be calibrated your response can be measured and you're really much more in control when you respond to something versus react to something. Right. You know, control is a big, I'll say it's a big issue currently. Again, we're in the year 2020, depending on when people are listening to this. And in this year, we have had a pandemic. We've had lockdowns. We have shutdowns. We've had a lot of deaths related to a to a pandemic that we haven't somewhat controlled yet at the time of this recording. We've had some riots, we've had racial you know, issues, we've had, uh, there'll be an election that'll be happening shortly after this is probably released and we know what happens during our election years. And in my opinion, many of those things, I do not have the ability to control, Nick. But I know that some of those things get to me. So I am probably not doing well at practicing the principles of stoicism, correct? Well, I think I would include myself in that bucket. And certainly many of your listeners probably would too. I mean, none of us, none of us is perfect. Right. And none of us is 100% master of our emotions and ability to control what we think. Yeah, but wouldn't you agree, though? I mean, wouldn't we all be a little bit better off if we could move, move our whatever our mental state is? Because I think stoicism is really a mental state, correct? Yeah, it seems to be. Yeah. So wouldn't it be cool to be able to move ourselves more towards only being mindful of those things that we can control, like whether or not we eat more sauerkraut or not? You control that, <laughs> correct? I, I try. I try. I think the uh, the delivery man bringing the sauerkraut has something to do with it, but I, I do my part. <laughs> yeah, you don't want those delivery men getting all into your, your sauerkraut there. But uh, anyway, well, I, I do think there's value because to me, listen, let's tie a few things together here. I've noticed that my productivity and especially creativity is related to how well I'm controlling my mindset but it's sometimes my mindset gets all out of whack. That's a technical term, by the way, out of whack. It gets out of whack because I'm thinking about, you know, whether it's good to wear a mask or not wear a mask or, you know, people tearing down statues in some part of the world, whether or not that's a good thing or a bad thing. And I'm trying not to take a side on either one of those, you notice. But what I'm saying is, is thinking about it, not really in my control. So I, I think I, I, need, I need to probably study some more in that arena, and, and I will. And as a follower of Christ, I think that it, it is not opposed to that belief system either. I think that, uh, that Christ reflected in, in many ways the ability to be quiet and be still and think and hear from, as he would say, hear from the Father. So Anyway, all right, very cool. All right, let's start going into uh, this, uh, this principle of the seven-hour book. My first question I've got to ask you is, seven hours, really? Are you sure seven hours that we can get a book out by then? I am, I am, and I think that, uh, I think that quite a few people would agree, but at the same time, I do qualifier. Want to give a qualifier. Yep, yep. <laughs> give my little, put my little asterisk up on the screen next to the statement, right? Um, no, it's seven hours of the person who we're working with, their time. They hop on with us over Zoom for seven one-hour calls of their time. On my side, my team and I, it's taking us substantially longer than seven hours to pull the notes together, write the chapters, coordinate all the marketing, do the cover designs, all of that stuff. But for the people we're working with, it is seven hours of their time. So I'm glad wow. you asked that, just to just to set the record straight on it. Yeah, I was going to say because you know sometimes people are hard to it's kind of hard to imagine and believe certain things like that. So 
anyway, that's, uh, that's kind of good to know, uh, because I was going to kind of go back to that four hour work week example we talked about earlier and say, you know, that four hour work week was a little bit of a marketing message as much as it was a practical thing. But, uh, but you know what, here's the cool thing about it is I think most of us can wrap our heads around seven hours. You know, we can't wrap our heads around seven years to write a book, right? <laughs> yeah. And, you know, to make this a little bit more, a little bit more realistic for your listeners to help them conceptualize a little bit better, I could give you, if you want, a overview of what a typical seven hour process would look like. Yeah, yeah, I'd love to. Yeah, hold on one second, because we may do that as we as we start getting where we wrap up here, because I'd love for you to kind of give exactly what this looks like. But, uh, but so, okay, so it is seven hours. But but one of the things I'd love for you to do is, can you peel back the curtain just a little bit and tell us, you don't have to give the secret sauce, but give, give all that's going on behind the scenes. In other words, what all are you and your company doing to bring this to fruition? Because there's a lot of stuff that I, I know. I'm, I've, got a, I've got a novel right now in edit phase that's about to go to publisher. And, uh, and there's a lot involved. So what all are you and what's your company doing? Sure. So what we're doing is certainly taking the calls with the authors themselves, mm -hmm. uh, getting the notes down there, guiding them through process of questions, getting the book out of their head, as we talked about. But then on the other side, you know, teams of writers, people on my side who are writing it, stitching it together, listening to the recordings. When we do record it, we don't always record it, but when we do record it, listening to the recordings of it, synthesizing the notes together, figuring out what parts don't work in the book and would need to be omitted or placed on the back burner, maybe for inclusion later on, uh, posting it in Google Docs so that the people we're working with are aspiring authors. If they want to review it, they can review it. Um, sometimes, believe it or not, they will put it up there for their review and they just don't even look at it, which Interesting. is, yeah, it's kind of strange, but <laughs> it does happen. And then other aspects of it would be coordinating cover designs, working with designers, to get a cover together for the book, submitting it to the people we're working with for review, making changes based on what they want. Also doing research into various printers to based on our clients, what they see as their budget, what they see as the number of copies they would want, trying to figure out who of the publishers and printers we know, and if people we would also research, who might be a good fit for them. Right, all right, all right. So, so there's a lot of, there's a lot of behind the scenes that is going on. So, so go ahead, let's go ahead and, and go into what, all right, I actually, I, I've got a background as a real estate investor. We had companies that were in real estate investing for years. And let's just say that I was, are they primary, are you working with real estate agents or investors or anyone in that real estate space? Who are you working with there? Certainly, we've done work with agents. I've got some people in the mid-Atlantic who we've worked with, particularly recently in real estate agent side, but also a lot of real estate investors. Okay. All right. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. Let's, I, I'm actually going to, I'm going to walk one of my clients through, you're going to kind of walk the process with me. Um, I've got a client that uh, she's an excellent real estate agent. She's down in the panhandle of Florida. And she's got great experience. She knows her stuff. And, uh, and let's just say that for some reason she decides, I think I may have interest in a book. But before she says yes to you, she is a little skeptical and wondering if it's something that she really should do. So what I would love for you to do is talk to her and me, pretend, pretend she's listening, and just tell her, I think you've done it a little bit already, but let's, let's just go ahead and go through the pitch, I guess, is why, if she's leaning this way, why she should go ahead and move forward. And, uh, and then after that, we'll talk about what her next steps are. But just get, put her over the hump. Get, get her to go ahead and make the decision. Well, you know, I'm, I'm almost not wanting to do that. Because <laughs> to be totally, totally transparent with you, Tim, I mean, the people we end up working with, they decide for themselves that they want to do a book. Okay. And I don't think, I mean, there might've been maybe early on instances where I would really try to push them over the edge to doing a book, but it's just really not my style. 
And I feel like the book and the decision to do a book really has to come from them. Okay. I mean, it's, I can, I can talk all about the merits of having a book, but it just, it really just has to be an individual decision that someone has to come to on their own. Okay, good. And I appreciate that integrity. That's a great response there that you didn't allow me to push you to pitch. So she is saying, yeah, I'd like to do a book. And, and, and I, and I think I've got some thoughts about it. Nick, help me out. What do I do next? Well, at that point, it would go back a little bit to that, to the part actually early in this conversation where we're talking about what are your goals for the book and why a book specifically over, over other things, like we talked about ads, we're going to events, why a book for those? Okay, well, I'll go ahead and answer that for, I think, what, what could be for her. She's in a very high-end real estate market. She's in a market that a lot of people from uh, towns like Atlanta, Nashville, other areas are very interested in this very, this small sliver of beautiful beach down in Florida. And, and she really wants to position herself as an authority and an expert for investors and people that are looking for second, possible third homes to, uh, to purchase. And she wants something tangible that, that can be put in their hands if they have interest in working with her or with that area. Is that good enough? Well, it's good in the sense that you knocked out something I was going to say, which is why not a podcast or why not a blog? You said the word tangible. Yes. And if you want something, as you're saying, to literally put in someone's hands, yeah. then a book probably is the best thing in that case. Sure. Because one of the things that we've done in the past is we've done some mailings. We've had some uh, you know, pre-qualified people that we would love to do something maybe a little bit over the top and to mail them a book to me would be a pretty cool thing to do, especially if it just reinforced and locked in someone that when they make that buy decision for a one, two, three, four million dollar piece of property, they're going to do it with her. So, so does that help out a little bit more? So is, does it sound like that might be a good option to, to get a book to do something like that? It could be. And I think that uh, for those of your listeners who are real estate agents and aren't familiar with the strategy, what you're describing sounds a lot like the idea of farming, real estate farming, where you farm an area and become the go-to person. And if you are looking to farm an area, uh, first off, there's a great book out there. A real estate coach actually wrote it. It's called uh, Farm. So I'd encourage anyone who's new to the idea of farming to check that out. Brian Eisenhower's his name. Mm -hmm. But then within that strategy of farming, a book really can be your central piece. It can become, as, uh, as Michael Hyatt talks about, uh, your platform. Okay, very good. So, all right, so, let's, so let's keep going then. So we've made the decision that I'm going to do the book. So what is the first thing that you do for me or, or her? And then um, what is the first thing that you're going to tell her to do? Well, I would ask her before it was even a foregone conclusion that we were going to be working together. I would ask, why not do it herself? And not in any kind of a mean way, but just what would you say is keeping you from being able to, as we were talking about time blocking, just saying every Saturday for the next 10, 15 Saturdays, I'm gonna spend one hour alone in a room, you know, lock the door to my office, lock the door to my study and just sit in there every Saturday, bring a good cup of tea, a good cup of coffee and just make that my hour to create something that's meaningful to me and it's gonna drive a really powerful result in my business. So I'd ask her that. Okay, and I'm gonna respond for her because I've been coaching her for five years. Uh, she's very busy is out a good bit, actually owns two companies, and most likely would say that the mental bandwidth to do that, also some health issues with, with parents that she's had to deal with, and the creative energy would be a challenge. How about that? And so, okay. so she probably would love someone to help her to do as much, if not all of it, as possible. Okay. I think that definitely, definitely is a fair thing. We do hear that from time to time. Yeah. I just have to ask that because we have had a couple of calls 
Uh, one in particular, this guy out in uh, the Midwest, I think it was Utah, Nevada, where I talked to him. We decided by the end of the call that he could do it himself. And I literally got an email about like four or five months later that was, hey, my book's out. And it was, it was great. Wow. It was really great to see it. <laughs> but, uh, but okay. That's impressive. All right. So, so she's, so you, so we've said, no, I, we need you guys to help. So, so what are you going to tell her next? What, what happens after that? Well, I would probably have to speak with her specifically and it would depend on the case itself. Okay. But depending on how things went, we would probably in some form or another come into working on the project. Okay. So, all right. So, so let's just, we're pretending a little bit here, but let's just say that you, you decide to work with someone and it seems like a good match. Everybody's comfortable with each other. Um, what, what do you typically have this person do or roughly do? You mentioned it earlier in the seven hours that they need to put their time in. What are they, or what is she, if we're using the she, the she here, what are you going to instruct or coach them to do? As little as they possibly can. <laughs> I mean, that's we, such a cool, that's such a cool response. I want you to do as little as you possibly can. <laughs> <laughs> well, really, this is this should almost be called the lazy man or lazy woman's <laughs> book writing system, because the idea really is that in, a, you know, a perfect case with this, all they should have to do is just show up on the calls and just talk to us. I mean, do we send them prep questions ahead of time? Yes. If that's something that they want, we can certainly send them prep questions. Do we post the chapters in Google Drive for them to review between calls? Yes, we do that. They don't have to look over it, as we've seen, but we do that. But literally, the least they would have to do is just show up seven times for a grand total of one hour each on those calls. And that would be, that would be the bare minimum they have to do. So you, so you do seven one-hour calls and where you're somewhat interviewing, or it sounds like, you tell me if I'm wrong here, that you're literally pulling a book out of this person. We are, we are. And it's sort of, you know how right now on this podcast, Tim, you're doing a great job of figuring out the various threads that we go down in this conversation, exploring ones that seem interesting, and really drawing the juice out of it for your listeners. That's what we're trying to do on these calls. When they'll say something that it's like, wait, what did you just say? Not in a bad way, but more like, this is intriguing. I can't believe you don't think this is significant because the people reading your book would. We're trying to explore those nooks and crannies of the conversation too. Yeah, and that's great, Nick. You know, I do when I do my when I'm online with coaching clients, I record them all the time for the simple reason: number one, my assistant gets the recording out to my clients, but there are things that are said from both parties often just because of the creative juices that are flowing when we're together, just like I think with you and I right here, that I don't I would have never come up with it. I'm not that smart and they may <laughs> not be either but the collective kind of pulls it out of each other and so sounds like you guys have a process in place to do that and and it's over the course of what seven one-hour calls is that right yeah it really is and what you're talking about right now for readers who aren't familiar excuse me i said readers listeners, listeners shows, yeah. <laughs> shows where i'm at right you're in the book mode man you're in book you're in book <laughs> mindset <laughs> But uh, for listeners who aren't familiar with the idea of the mastermind from Napoleon Hill's Think and Grow Rich, I feel like that's really what we're kind of dancing around with this. The idea that when a couple of people get together, even if it's two people, three people, however many, but when they get together and start talking, it's like there's a third or there's, there's another force that's created a, that is composed of those ideas that none of the people on their own would have come up with. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, all right, so you do these seven one-hour calls. Are you, are you or someone on your team like writing like crazy uh, in between those calls or somebody's got to put some words on paper? Is that what you do or do you have people on your team that do that? It's a shared responsibility. And you talked about writing furiously. We're not, to be clear, we're not using legal pads. I know that's your forte, oh, Tim. Jotting <laughs> stuff down on legal pads. But we're, <laughs> we're, we're typing away, but <laughs> that's how we're getting everything jotted down. Okay, good. And so, so, so from the time that someone says, let's start doing calls to, I guess you've got to schedule seven calls. So I don't know if it's from the time to start or the time the last call occurs. When's somebody going to have a book? 
we found usually that the sweet spot in terms of book times just over the years has been around four to six months. Okay. And just in terms of doing the calls, I would say beyond that, once we've got the book manuscript together, once we've got the cover design, for example, when it's coordinating with a printer, that can take a little while longer. Um, I want to warn some of your listeners out there that sometimes when you send it to a printer, their specifications will be different than what you're thinking in terms of formatting, in terms of various sizing for other aspects of the book. So be, be aware sometimes that you may need to change stuff around based on what the printer at the end of the day, who's actually churning out the physical copy of the book, what they may require. Right. And, but, but you guys, for people you work with, y'all really manage that process quite a bit, correct? Which process? The process of the printer, y'all. Are y'all helping take it to printer or y'all, are y'all getting it back to the, uh, to the, to the person and they handle all the printing? We're not a printing operation in and of, our, of ourselves, but we try to be as seamless as possible ah. between connecting them to the printer and getting quotes from the printer, those sort of things. Okay, very good. So, so you are really kind of a single point of connection to try to get all the pieces done for, for the book, which I think is very helpful because, you know, one thing you talked about earlier was the covers and printing all artwork and all of those things. So you have connections to all of those. Is that correct? It is, it is. And we try to leverage that in a positive way for the best value of our clients as much as possible. Okay, very good. All right. So is there anything else about your process or your system that would be helpful for us to know? I've got a few other questions I want us to wrap up with, but anything else that you wish I had asked you about the structure or the process? Yeah, I think one thing that's important to point out is that we go into this not from the standpoint of English majors, but rather from the standpoint of entrepreneurs and marketers in the sense that this is not Certainly the book will sound good and it'll be, we would hope, well-written, but this is not, let's write a book of flowery language that makes people laugh. This is, let's put together a book that's going to drive a specific result and result in a very real ROI on the part of the people who are putting it out. This is not, let's have a book that's, that's feel good. Let's, it's, it's more about, let's have a book that drives results, that convinces people that in the case of your real estate agent, that they are the authority in their area, that they are more qualified, that they are more experienced, and that really they know more about what they're doing than others and therefore deserve your business. That's yes. the kind of books that we're putting together. So not necessarily a book with a, with a Pulitzer, but a book with a purpose. Is that would be a, be a good way of saying it? It is. It is. And I would say for your listeners, regardless of whether they would work with someone like our team or others, you don't need to have that Pulitzer Prize winning book. You don't need to have a, quote, New York Times bestselling book. You need a book that is going to resonate with a very select group of people in your market and cause them to take whatever actions you want them to take. Beyond that, it's not as important the other parts. Yeah, and, and you mentioned a term I think that's very important, which is ROI. And many people I know write or create something because it's a passion project and they just want to get it out to the world and they think the world is going to think it's awesome just because they've gotten it out there. I love the thought of the message going to the audience that you want to, you want it to match up to and getting some response or, you know, have some kind of a, a um, call to action and things like that that are important. So I think that's valuable and that's very good that you, uh, you brought that up. Anything else? Anything else about the system or process? Yeah, with that last part about the call to action. When we say a call to action, it does not have to be in the, what many would think of as a spammy context in that by now, 995, shipping and handling, you know, while supplies yeah. last, it does not have to be that kind of a call to action. Yeah. One of the simplest call to actions that we've seen, particularly in the case of real estate investors, where many of them are not allowed to directly solicit for funds in their investment has just been, if this book resonated with you, or if you have more questions, here's my email address. And your call to action could be as simple as that. Hmm. Now, could you go all out with the marketing and put in websites and splash pages and all that other stuff? Certainly you could, but a call to action really can be, 
a very nice, simple ask with an email address. So I think it's important your listeners understand that as they're considering all the ways to get people to take action based on their book. Yeah, and that's that's really, really good that you brought that up because some people think call to action means if you don't buy in the next 60 minutes, you know, the world's going to blow up or something like that. So very good. I like that you thought, you know, that you brought up just the call to action is just connect. You know, if this resonated, if you enjoyed what you read and would like to reach out to us, connect with us. So that's that's very good, which then that opens up di- dialogue. And it's, listen, business is more process than an event. And I love that what you're saying is the book is, is an integral, but, but it's a part of the process. And, uh, and I like that. Thank you for doing that. I want to ask a few things as we're getting close to wrapping up here. Uh, the person that thinks they may want a book, I would love for you to give a few what next for them. And I, I want to do it first in the area the, of people that may not be your people. Let's just say it's someone who's non-real estate. They've been listening to this. Maybe they like the process we talked about. Maybe not. I mean, you know, we're, we're cool with that too, but they're just going, huh? You know, I keep listening to things and I've listened to this podcast about, about doing a book. I think I'd like to take the next step. What would you recommend for someone? And let's just say they're non-real estate or even are whatever they are, but what do you think they should do next? I think they should do what we've talked about with time blocking and carve out an hour. An hour always seems to be a pretty good length of time to do thinking and lock themselves away in a study or in an office somewhere. Get out the legal pad, our old favorite, and uh, just brainstorm what they could do with a book. Mm -hmm. And when they do that, and they do that brainstorming, they'll start to have an idea of what the final destination would be for a book. And then they can work backward, do a little bit in the one thing they talk about goal setting to the now, but work backward and see what are all of the possible roads that would lead to that result. And if a book was one of those roads, how it would lead to the result. So really starting as, uh, as Simon Sinek talks about starting with why, making that their, their starting point. Yeah, that's, and, and you know what, I love that because what it does is it keeps someone from going down a path that may not be a fit for their business model. You know, I mean, there, even if it's only seven hours, that's seven hours that if you're going down that path, you, you maybe should have spent that seven hours doing something else. So thank you for, for saying that, Nick, that was, that was extremely powerful. So let's just say that someone is listening and they want to connect with you and either have a chat with you get more information, get a book, whatever. How can people connect with you, Nick? Sure. They would go after they've thought about why they want a book. and conclude After the why. Don't, don't, don't get in touch with you before, right? <laughs> <laughs> after, after all of that was taken care of, they could go to our website at uh, contentcore.net, and that's spelled C-O-N-T-E-N-T-C-O-R-P-S dot net net content core like the marine corps dot net yeah excellent we'll make sure all that is down in the notes but uh what's next for you nick what what's next either short term long term big picture small picture what's coming up for nick sure so i can give you both of those a uh, short term probably hop out of this and uh, get something to drink because i don't know about you tim but it's also pretty hot where i am it is very and, hot. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, and then beyond that sort of long-term, continue to work with amazing authors and continue to really help them to get their, not only their stories out there, but also help them to achieve whatever the purpose is in their business. And I think connected to that, we may in the future start looking a little bit more toward audiobooks because as uh, Amazon and Audible have pointed out, listening is the new reading. And uh, there could very much be an opportunity there, as we've heard from a number of our authors wanting audiobooks. So we may go in that direction. Wow, that's exciting to hear. My wife is much more of an audiobook person than I am. I listen to podcasts. She listens to audiobooks. And, you know, podcasting is kind of this weird hybrid. There are actually people in the podcast world that are now using the podcast medium for putting books out too. It's kind of like episodes or chapters and things like that. It's very cool. Well, 
We have had such a cool conversation. We started off with demons, stoicism, sauerkraut, all over the place, books in seven hours, to call to actions and much, much more. Nick, final question I've got for you, and who knows where it can go. I'm going to kind of keep you limited because that was a lot of stuff there. The title of this podcast is Seek, Go, Create. And what I like to ask as a final question is, which one of those words jumps out at you as more significant than others or whatever? Just which one, when I say those three, jumps out at you and why? Hmm. Well, I would say it's a tie between go and create. Now, we're talking all about books, so the create part, of course, is going to stir me. Mm -hmm. But the go really resonates because, frankly, as you and I and all of our listeners know, if you don't go in the sense of taking action and getting up off the sofa, taking out the earbuds, and actually going out and taking action on what it is that you intend to do, nothing's going to happen. You can listen to all the mindset, all the motivation, all the podcasts, watch all the YouTube videos, do all of that stuff. But if you don't go and actually get started, it's all avail. It's all to no avail. It's not going to, nothing's ever going to materialize. As Zig Ziglar says, you know, you don't have to be great to get started, but if you, if you don't get started, you'll never be great. So you got to take that action. Yeah. And that's cool. That actually ties back to what you said at the very beginning. You help people get the demons out so they could get something done. So Man, I love how that came together. Nick, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast. I really appreciate you taking the time to share with us. If you are listening and would like to continue this conversation, we encourage you to do that. We welcome it. Go to seekgocreate.com. That's seekgocreate.com to comment on the episode post, or you can contact us via email there. Visit the site, give us your best email address, and we'll also make sure you never miss an episode. On top of that, We're going to get you some bonus items for free that we give out for specific episodes or just for just for our general listeners. You can also find us and communicate on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Instagram. In all of those places, we are Seek, Go, Create. Thank you again for joining us. We look forward to connecting with you on the Seek, Go, Create podcast in the near future.